In this video, I'm going to take a look at the Helios 44M6, a 58mm f2 lens. My copy was made in 1994 in the Valdai factory in Russia. I've also included photo transitions taken wide open and stopped down to give you an extended view of how the lens performs. If you want to go straight to these photo transitions, I've posted a link in the description below. The Helios 44 M6 was one of a series of lenses produced in different factories in Russia between 1958 and 1999, all with the same optical design but with modifications over the years. Here are just some of the main versions. The 44 M6 is one of four lenses produced with a similar body design and multi coatings. Right now, I own three of these the M4, the 6, and the 7 versions. Tests published online suggest that the optical resolution of the M4, 5, 6 and 7 lenses increase as you go up the series. There's also some debate about whether the famous Helios swirls of earlier 44s and 442s continue into the later lenses. Now I'm not going to start with a detailed debate about the 44 M6 versus the other versions, because I think it distracts from the qualities of the lens itself. It's a little like a younger child in a large family. Sometimes he or she gets less attention than they really deserve. The point is that the Helios 44 M6 is a fine lens in its own right, and it deserves to spend more time in the spotlight, and not get lost in arguments about the relative strengths of different Helios 44 versions. I will, however, do a brief comparative analysis at the end. But before that, here's my review of the Helios 44 M6. It's an M42 screw mount lens with six elements in four groups and six aperture blades. Like all Helios 44s, it's supposed to be a derivative of the old Carl Zeiss Jena Biota 58F2 design. There's a pin at the back that needs to be pushed in to get the lens to stop down when it's mounted on most digital camera adapters. It's quite a simple procedure to fix the pin in a way that can be reversed later if you want, and Retro Photo House on YouTube has a good video on how to do this. My lens weighs around 228 grams, and it's a solid, well-built lens. It's one of a number of Russian lenses that were built like a proverbial tank. It fits well on digital camera adapters, there's no wobbling with this lens, and the aperture controls are nice and snappy. One complaint about the build quality, well not really about the build quality, but how it ages over time, is that the lubricants for the focus ring can become a little stiff, and my copy certainly suffers from this, but this can be sorted out if you want. The lens has a minimum focus distance of 0.5 meters, which I generally find is close enough, although I sometimes crop images to get closer. The lens is multi-coated and the coatings appear to work well, but in bright conditions it does help to use a hood with the lens. The lens with hood doesn't show significant light leaks, so the images tend not to have patches of lighter rendering that reduce contrast, something you see with some other old lenses. The lens doesn't flare dramatically all the time, even pointing it at or near the sun, but if pushed you can get it to flare as this image shows. Whether you think this is an advantage or not depends on how much you enjoy playing with flares. So the coatings give images good light and dark contrasts, and also good colour contrasts. I'd say the contrasts and colours are pretty good for an old lens. Not as good as the very best film era Fast 50s, but certainly better than the earlier lesser coated Helios's, although I promise not to compare of course. Personally, I don't find f2 to be too slow when the lens is wide open. You still get very smooth bokeh in many situations, and some lovely highlight shapes round at the centre and more oval or cat sized towards the edge of the frame, which help to give the background a swirly look. And the lens does indeed swirl in the right conditions. With the busiest of backgrounds, you don't get that ultra smooth blur and extremely narrow depth of field that you get with an f1.2 or f1.4 lens. And that may be a showstopper for some, but then you'd need to pay extra for that kind of effect. The lens is center sharp all the way from wide open to stop down. You'll see some more examples of how the lens performs from wide open to stop down later. And while you're looking at these photos, I should also point out that the lens doesn't suffer from a lot of purple fringing. But in very bright, reflective conditions, it can occasionally fill dark areas with purple, as I hope you can see here. Wide open, as long as you nail the focus, the images are sharp on the subject in focus, with a good blur and a good subject isolation. I have a number of old lenses that are not nearly as sharp wide open as this lens. From the very first time I used this lens, I've been a big fan of the bouquet. It's really smooth and colourful, without being overpowering. The colours can be quite vibrant straight out of camera. On sunny days, for example, you can get some lovely images of colourful subjects, such as flowers. The colours really do pop. The lens works well on both full frame and crop sensors. I actually prefer using the Helios on a crop sensor for many compositions, because you get a more intimate look. On the other hand, full frame is better for getting a wider angle view and that full swirly look. 
because a crop sensor crops out the edges where those bokeh highlights are the most distorted. The lens makes a good portrait lens, both on full-frame cameras and also on 1.5 crop cameras, where the lens turns into a classic portrait-style lens, similar to an 85mm lens. Again, you'll get excellent subject isolation when the lens is wider open, good details and attractive bouquet. There are a number of portraits with this lens to look at online if you're interested. Stop down, the lens sharpens up even more, and it's a perfectly decent product shot lens, as well as a good lens for walking around town and landscapes. The lens only has six blades, and normally I prefer fast 50s with more blades, but for some reason, I've been rather liking the hexagon this lens produces. Here are some examples of these hexagons. I think they add to the texture of the blur, instead of being completely distracting. And the blades can produce some nice, clean starbursts at night. The edge-to-edge -edge details the lens produces in landscape shots look okay, especially on crop sensors. Here's a shot down a railway track, stop down. I'll move around the image. I've seen better, but I've seen a lot worse. And for an early comparison, I'd say the rendering is better than the results you get from most 44.2 versions. The images are crisper with better contrasts and colours, not the slightly washed out images you can sometimes get from the 44.2. Crop sensors do help some old lenses because they crop out the less well rendered parts of the image towards the edge. I'm not a big pixel peeper around the edges of photos, partly because less well-defined edges can in fact give an image a more 3D look. However, for the record, I will go pixel peeping with a couple of full-frame images stopped down. Starting with this straight-out-of-camera photo of Kew Railway Bridge across the Thames. At the centre, the image is really sharp. But when you move towards the edges, well, it's clearly not doing so well. I'll just spend a few seconds scrolling up and down this photo, and you can see the results. The rendering is a little fuzzy at the top. And these stones at the bottom are not well captured at all. Secondly, this full frame photo of a foxglove. Again, the centre is really good, but go up or down to the top of the foxglove, or down to the stem at the bottom, and the details are not nearly so good. And then compare it with this image of the same flower, made up of five photos stitched together. Now it's got great overall sharpness. This is a technique I sometimes use with these old lenses for closer up shots. I've also tried the lens as a macro lens, both on its own by cropping into a larger image and using magnifying glass, and it performs very well. Here are some examples I've cropped and also played around with vignetting. And some images taken with a Raynox M250 magnifying lens attached to the front. The details are excellent. In conclusion, the Helios 44 M6 is a solid lens, sharp at the centre, with good colour rendering and lovely, not too overpowering bouquet. There are many fast 50s I enjoy using for their images and bouquet, but not so many I'd want to take on a family holiday, for example because they're more specialist lenses that are not very good as all-purpose lenses. But the Helios 44 M6 is a lens I'd be happy to take along for snaps of people and places, plus some fun with more artistic, wide-open shots. And now onto that comparison with other lenses in the Helios 44 series. I'm going to limit the discussion to the earlier 44 and 44 II versions. That doesn't mean to say that the 44.3 and the 44M aren't worthy lenses, quite the opposite, but I'm just going to stick with the early versions to keep this short. Physically, the Helios 44M6 is a more solid lens than the 44.2, and it sits more solidly on digital cameras. The 44.2's mount isn't as well designed, it can wobble a bit on adapters. The Helios 44M6, and the M4 and M7 for that matter, appears to have stronger contrasts and colours than the 44.2, and these later multi-coated versions perform better stop-down than the 44.2. I've noticed a few minor differences in sharpness and rendering across the three later versions, but they're very minor and may even be explained by copy variation. Wide open, I like the results from all the Helios lenses, but I tend to prefer the dreamier rendering of the earlier lesser-coated lenses, and the 13 blades of the 44 version do produce pleasing results when the lens is stopped-down a little. And if you're curious about those swirls, I took a full frame photo of the same scene with the Helios 44.2 and the 44M6 to see whether there are huge differences in swirls, and here are the results. There's hardly any difference, at least in this composition. Now I personally think there are other factors involved in how swirly an image looks, including differences in coatings, contrasts, and how the images are processed. 
And I still reckon it's easier to generate swells from the early 44s and 442s than the later lenses, a statement that is not supported by the kind of control test I've just shown you. However, that's a debate for another day. Leaving aside the swells, if you already own a Helios 44.2 and you're thinking of getting a Helios 44 M6, then I think you'll find it feels like a different lens, a lens that produces cleaner, more colourful images stopped down. So you won't be wasting your time or your money getting the lens. At the prices these lenses sometimes go for, they are good value for money. And the final word about why I decided to spend all this time taking photos with the lens and preparing this view, especially when I also own a 44 m 7 a lens that is supposed to be a slightly better lens, as well as the other members of the family I haven't reviewed individually, including the exceptional Silver 44. Well, the 44 m 6 is the latest lens I've acquired, and it only cost me the equivalent of $30. Luckily for me, and unluckily for the seller, nobody else bid on the lens, so it really is the unloved younger child. And the more I used the lens, the more I enjoyed the experience, and I ended up spending some serious time with the lens. No doubt I'll pay the same compliment to the other individuals in the family sometime. For the rest of the video, I'm going to show you some transitions between wide open and stock down images. I hope they'll give you a good idea of the kind of photos the lens can produce. Although the images have been processed, in most cases they're just some minor adjustments. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe if you haven't already done so, and you'll be able to catch some more of the reviews I'll be posting.